Welcome to the All Podcast. We're the Academy of Logic and Light. I'm Megan. I'm Kat. I'm Julie. We are an ethical community education platform that provides a safe space for people to practice their spirituality without indoctrination. (laughs) Thanks, everyone, for tuning in to the All Podcast. Um, I'm Megan. Of course, I'm here with Julie, and we have Kat as well. And then we have another Julie here who we're so excited to have as our first guest on our podcast. So it's it might be a little bit of a rough ride, but we are so glad that you wanted to stop by and, yeah, share with us all of your amazing things you're doing. Can you awesome. tell us yeah. tell us a little bit about yourself? Yes. Uh, thank you so much, first off, for having me. I'm super excited. I haven't been on a podcast before, so make me sound really cool, okay? <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. Um, well, my name is Julie Black, and I am the current high priestess of a coven. It's called Coven of the Dark Mother. And um, I started some deconstructing religion classes. And that's how I kind of met you guys. And that's just kind of what I'm doing with my life right now. I'm a former member of the LDS Church. I've studied religion and cults for, oh, well over a decade. And I belonged to one. So yay. (laughs) And now I'm in the occult. So (laughs) yes. Oh, I love that so much. I also was previously part of the LDS church. And so I'm so excited to hear what you have been working on and stuff. So what at what point of your journey did you know that you were leaving the church and that it wasn't for you and that maybe there was? More? Well, that's interesting. I, you know, I feel like it came to me in waves and it came throughout the entirety of my religious journey i remember being very young and having these very prolific thoughts i'm eight years old and i'm so excited to relieve all of my sins through baptism right i go through this baptism and then like nothing happened and i was like what 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 the fuck? Literally, I'm like eight years old. And I was like, well, shit, there's another sin. But um, I remember having that distinct thought at eight years old, like my sins didn't wash away. I knew that. I knew that they didn't wash away. I knew nothing happened. Um, and then when I went through Young Woman's, um, it was just really hard. I I tried really hard to be a really good Mormon, um, but I really descended out of the church in my 20s, um, I had decided that I I was a single mother to three children, and I had decided that I was ready to go through the temple after being out of the church for about eight years. And I came back to the church. I was doing everything I was supposed to. I was a reformed sinner, and I was not sinning. I wasn't even having sex, right? Like, I was being a quote-unquote good girl. Um, but I get, I go through these classes. They tell me I have to go through these religious classes to go through the temple and I'm doing it. And I'm about 26 years old at this time. And this Bishop has me go into a meeting and he tells me that, um, they decided, they just decided that I wasn't ready to go through the temple because I was really young and I'd, I'd have, I'd experienced a lot of sin in my life. And he points to my three children and he tells me, you need to be forgiven for all of your sins. And he holds up a finger for each of my kids. And I was like, oh, we're done. So that's oh, it. Wow. So that's my cue. And I was like, I'm done. Oh wow. my gosh. I mean, that is a very defining moment. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Yeah. I I was too. I I sat there and I looked at him and I looked at my kids and I stood up and I was like, well, I think we're done here. And he's like, I'll see you next Sunday. I'm like, no, you actually will never see me again. That's it. Right. (laughs) I'm out. Yeah. 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 What a turn that meeting took. (laughs) Yeah, if I'm going to hell, you'll be right next to me, buddy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, that is so horrible. Wow. The church's idea of sin was just really, it's so damaging. Really, it's damaging, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. 
So yeah, that's when I decided that it was time to leave the church, like for good. But um, Proposition 8 also came up around that time. So I think it was around 20, 2008. If I remember correctly, I could be wrong on the dates, but um, Proposition 8 came out and the church was like, if you are affiliated, if your family is affiliated, your children are affiliated with somebody that is gay, we don't want anything to do with you. You can't, your children can't come to church or they, you know, they wanted to create this huge separation. And I just knew, I knew I was a queer witch for so many years, you know, I knew it. So I was like, that's when I got my name out of the church. I had my name, I went to a lawyer and um, it was quitmormon.org. I filed my paperwork and I was shaking, but I did it and I was like, all right, here we go. Yeah. And yeah, I was free from them. <laughs> oh, wow. What a day. That felt, probably yeah. felt more like a baptism than the actual baptism. <laughs> <laughs> it did. Yeah, I felt so much more with that experience than I did receiving this sacred baptism, you know, quote mm -hmm. unquote sacred. I mean, it is sacred. I'm not I'm not going to deny that their rights and what they do. It is sacred, but it wasn't for me, you know. <laughs> yeah. Totally. yeah. 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 Um, so I was also raised LDS. I think, though, that I um, was definitely a lot more fortunate than a lot of people that live in the Salt Lake Valley because my mom converted um, to being LDS as an adult because she recognized, I think, mostly that if you're going to live here, that's the easiest way for your kids to fit in. Um, True. But my mom never really bought all the way in. She always drank coffee. She had tequila. She never went to the temple. Church was kind of like... If it's at a reasonable time, we can go, but I'm not waking up at seven o'clock to go to church on Sundays. Um, so I always sort of had one foot out. Um, and by the time that my brother and I were old enough to stay home alone, it became our decision whether or not we wanted to go at all. Um, so I was really blessed in that way. Um, I do know several people that the biggest obstacle for them deciding to leave the church was family so i'm curious mm -hmm. um like where your family falls in that area if you're open to talking about that if that was difficult for them or um like how they played a role in all of your leaving the church and deconstruction and where are they are now if you are yeah. open to talking about that yeah i would love to share that um so i I, I kind of have to go back to when I was a member of the church. So I had, um, I, I lost two brothers by the time I reached 16. And this plays a big part in my story, a big part in my religious story as well. So I had two brothers that had muscular dystrophy. And so my parents really just glommed on to the religion because I mean, imagine being a mother and knowing that you're going to lose two children. I'm sure I would have been like, fuck yeah, sign me up. Time in all eternity? Yep, I'm there. Can I swear, by the way? Sorry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I, should have, I should have asked in the beginning, but... Um, <laughs> So I, I can I, I know that's why my parents had that perspective. My mom, especially the church was very important to her. It was something that allowed her to have an eternal family. Mm -hmm. And the vision of that inter eternal family was very important to my parents. But ironically, as we're growing up and we're going to the church, um, my dad stopped going to church, but it was still required that I went. Mm -hmm. And then as my brother's terminal illness got worse, I was the only one going to church. Mm -hmm. I was the only one being forced by myself as a child to sit mm -hmm. through sacrament and Sunday school and um, young women's. So I would go, I would walk down to the church regardless of the weather, and I would I would be the little golden girl, you know, for my family. I was that representation for the black family. So it was imperative that I did that. Um, and I just watched my dad throughout the years. I watched as my mom was really leaning into this religion. My dad was leaning out of it. And he would have philosophical discussions with me. There were times he would never say that the church was not true, but there were times where he would 
question the church and he would question um the fact that he had to terminally ill children he he looked at that as a stain or he looked at that as a bad thing right it was really bad like why would god do this to me if god was real he wouldn't give me two terminally ill children Mm -hmm. and then my mom in the next breath she is so thankful to heavenly father for these quote unquote blessings having terminally ill children is not a blessing and it should not be looked at as a blessing it's hard and it's difficult and it was hard for her but she turned it into a blessing so Um, I had two brothers that were incredibly spiritual beings. Like my oldest brother, he was like looking into the light of Christ, the way that it was described, you know, very humble, very um, just pure and kind. And you just, it radiated from him. Mm -hmm. And then my, my next oldest brother was really funny and quirky. And he had this little sticker on the back of his wheelchair that said, um, we're all going to hell and I'm driving the bus, you know? (laughs) And this was like, this was before that was acceptable, you know, like this is in the, this is in the nineties. So, I mean, we, we come from a very funny family. So, it was interesting because I saw that division and I saw that I was this representation and it just pushed me to do better and better and better. And then um, I'm trying to think, I remember I was probably around 13 and I was sitting in the middle of the chapel by myself. And I was surrounded by all of these families and like they're singing this families are forever song and I my I was the only one there I don't think any of my brothers had passed at that time I was listening to the music and I could feel the spirituality or the spiritual the Mormon religion you can you can feel it swell like it's Mm -hmm. tangible it exists I will never deny that Mm -hmm. and it's swelling and people are getting into it and there and you can just see these families and I'm like why is a witch in church? Like out of nowhere. I was like, oh shit. Like, whoa, where did that come from? I'm 12. And I was like, what? Like, and it's in my voice, right? I'm saying yeah. it. And that was like this this huge moment for me when I was like, I just knew it. I knew that I was a witch. I knew that um, I couldn't be contained in those walls just because it wasn't like it wasn't what it didn't feel good i saw it i witnessed it but it wasn't what was right for me so that 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 moment that was very prolific for me and then um going through my brother's funerals was another really prolific moment i was sitting in there and i remember i was so young and i just kept thinking about sin and they were talking about how perfect my brothers were and i was like you know like they they sinned i was their sister they they were sinners you know and it just created this huge division for me and that's kind of when i decided that i couldn't belong to a religion that i felt was corrupt in just the most simple of ways like those are not ways that you should be corrupt those are ways that it should be natural um and and that's i think i felt very young i felt the corruption um my dad never ended up going back to church um they did actually uh after i had had children a little bit later in life they tried to get me to baptize my kids uh, but i never did i knew i knew I was done. I knew that I didn't want my kids to go through that. Um, I did at one point, my daughter asked me at eight if she could be baptized. And I I said, absolutely, you can be baptized. Why do you want to get baptized? And she was like, well, mom, I want to get baptized because all of my friends are. And I was like, yeah, and that's really cool. It's really cool that all your friends are getting baptized, but why are they doing it? Well, they're members of the church. Yeah, they are. And their families are members of the church too. And um, basically it ended in her not having the proper testimony. And I, I would never deny my child of that. If they have a testimony, great. I will, I will take you to the end of the earth. I will support you. I will go with you to church. Um, but 
she couldn't come up with anything other than that. So I told her like, nope, we're not going to do that. Um, mm -hmm. When you are old enough, you are welcome and I will support you. When you have a testimony, I will gladly support you. Um, mm -hmm. But I had left the church completely. My kids didn't like the church. I was a single mom. My parents helped me a lot. So they would make my kids go to church. But there came a point when... Um, I, it was nine years ago. I bought this house and um, I just, it was like another witchy calling. I could feel the, my witchcraft here. And I also knew that I was going to um, practice polyamory full time. I had made that conscious decision. And so I, I had a girlfriend that I was going to move in. And so I like told my parents everything. I was like, all right, well, here, here it is. Here's everything. And I sat on like a, a 45 minute conversation with my mom and my dad and my mom was wailing and she was crying and she's like, what about your kids? You know, and my dad's like, this is the stupidest thing you could ever do. And I was like, cool, still doing it. Like, here we are. I'm, I'm doing it. Um, so we had that conversation. And I mean, there were times that I wasn't allowed to even drink coffee in my parents' home. I wasn't allowed to swear. Like, if I swear in front of them, they lose it. So it, there was a huge transition. And I just stood very solid in when I made a decision. I was like, no, I know I'm making the right decision. Is it the hard decision? Yes. But I'm making the right decision. Um, and then flash forward to a lot of years, um, my kids didn't, no one ever got baptized. My dad passed away uh, in 2020, but right before he passed away, I found out that he was living a double life and he had been forcing me into the religion all of these fucking years. And he was making fun of me when I was openly polyamorous and telling me how disgusting I was because I was, I was using my integrity. I was being honorable and I was being, I was, I was being honest, right? I don't talk to wow. him anymore, obviously he's passed on, but mm -hmm. I didn't talk to him for the last of his life for the last six months. Um, and mm -hmm. not, I, not, it was just like, he would tell me, like, he would literally call me a whore because <sighs> I was polyamorous. And it's like, bro, okay, call it whatever you want. Like, I don't care. You can say that. You can you can say that I'm bad because I choose to love multiple people. Like, the thing is, when I was in multiple relationships, I wasn't. It wasn't like I was sleeping around with a ton of people either. You know what I mean? I know this is mm. not religion. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but my sexual freedom was a big part of deconstructing religion and taking back my sexual preferences or whatever you know that was a really big part of it um my mom flash forward to my mom she is still alive but we don't talk anymore she can't respect me and where i'm at and i can't respect her i can't respect people that just li live like this double life it's wild to me so mm -hmm. that's where uh, and the rest of my family passed so i i just i only have my mom left and then my children and my kids are not at all LDS. So yeah, that's my that's my family story. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. That's so fascinating. Is it, isn't it always the ones that like point the finger and like bark the loudest that have the most issues usually? I was thinking the exact same thing. I was like, that's so tell that level of projection is so telling when you're that hurtful towards somebody that is engaging in a behavior that you're also engaging in because in my experience anyway a lot of times because my dad's side of the family is super lds um, my dad is not but he did he did go on a mission but his whole side of the family came uh across with the pioneers mm -hmm. um wow. and so uh i have a cousin that is that has transitioned and mm -hmm. when that came out, it was obviously such a huge issue. And a lot of people just kind of either just didn't say anything and just cut them out. Um, but then other people asked questions like, why would you do this? Why are you doing this? Instead of outright, like, you're the worst person, which I know people generally say. But to me, it seems like when there's that heavy level of attacking it comes with some level of projection. 
whether mm -hmm. they're engaging mm -hmm. in that behavior or they're ashamed of something they have done or something else that it just comes well, out. Jealousy and, too, or, right? That's a yeah. jealousy trait too. Mm. Yeah, totally. Well, um, and I feel like with high demand religions like the LDS church, you find so many more people who are living those double lives because in order to fit in and stay within the community that you have, you have to present yourself a certain way. And if you don't do that, then you're kind of ostracized from your community. <clears throat> and so I, I feel like it's encouraged people to live these double lives and they're not being their authentic selves, you know, at least in some aspect, because they have to fit the mold that the religion has provided for them. I know and that an unattainable that mold. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Like no one can reach no this. One. Yeah. So you're all going to hell. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Hell's a good motivator though, right? Apparently. I mean, yeah. I was like, like send me there. I want to do it. Let's go, bro. Like, <laughs> I actually had somebody tell me a week ago. Um, that I'm going to hell and I was like cool okay let's do it like I'm ready <laughs> I'm bringing marshmallows <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> wow that's wild and then I had another question because obviously you mentioned like knowing that you were a witch for real from a really young age uh like what was something that kind of made you know I guess um let's see I think literally it was a thought that I developed at a very young age um I I hate to talk about Harry Potter and witchcraft because I think that um one kind of demeans the other because they aren't on the same playing field however um when Harry Potter came out I was a young girl and that was the first time I really could tangibly understand what I, I really thought somebody was going to come and pick me up, right? Like, I've always thought that. I always <laughs> thought I was going to be told that um, I was living with the wrong family. I I had visions when, from a very young age. I just knew things. I could see things. I could see spirits. I could, I could experience energies. And that just was woo culture back then. That was something that the religion would talk about as bad or like if it wasn't Christ centered, it was the devil. And I always remember thinking, well, shit, then I'm the devil. <laughs> because I like, I don't, I don't know. I just was very perceptive to that stuff. And I always just knew I've always identified as a witch. And so it was more like I was trying to fit into their mold. Mm. Yeah, I like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And when did you start making classes? Um, so my deconstructing religion started about six month, months ago. And it just started with the coven where I was just, a lot, we were doing it like twice a month. And then I was like, you know, I think this is something that other people need. I think other people need a way to talk about it or learn how to take some of those first steps. So I just kind of, um, I'm, I'm obsessed with cults. I love learning about cults. <laughs> and I had too. been listening to Was I in a Cult? Have you guys heard that one? Uh -uh. Mm -mm. So good. I highly recommend it. What's it on? It. <laughs> um, Spotify. It's on Spotify. Oh, okay. Yeah. And it's called Was I in a Cult? Um, and the go it goes over oh. all. Okay. Sorry. You know, I thought you, you said Was I on a Cult, but you said oh. Was I in a Cult? That yes. I have heard of. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Was I in a Cult? Um, but I had been listening to it and um they hate witchcraft <laughs> which i think is so funny whatever i don't care um i was like i need to do something like this but i need to do it for my people and my people are witchy people so i decided i would make that into the uh, uh into the coven curriculum and then i just decided that i wanted to roll it out to other people because i want to do a podcast i want to talk about religion um so yeah so it started about six months ago Cool. Oh, love that. Thank you for doing the work. It's so hard. <laughs> yes. And so um, needed. Yeah. Yes. So I have a question for you. As someone who like also deconstructed from religion, 
I have a, a hard time. I find myself kind of hesitant to like work with a deity. Do you mm -hmm. have an experience of like how that worked for you? Was it hard for you? Was it pretty easy? Or do you have any advice for kind of bridging that gap of like, I want to be spiritual. I want to work with deity, but I just find myself like, you know, it starts to get a little bit like prayer like, and I'm like, okay, is this too close to like my religious trauma? Is it starting to like give me anxiety? So anyway, I'm just interested. No, I, I love that. Um, and it's something I would love to talk about. So first and foremost, I think that we, um, so I've been away from the church for a really long time. I've been away long enough that I'm able to step back and look at it and view it differently. So it's going to happen in stages for everybody, right? Mm -hmm. um, the first thing we have to do, it's the hardest thing. And that is we have to get uncomfortable, right? And sometimes that discomfort is going back to a place where we knew comfort previously, right? So we have to get okay with those things. We have to get okay with the fact that we might be praying again, mm -hmm. that it might feel the same, but feeling the same doesn't mean that we're regressing. It just means that we are bringing comfort into our life now and where we're at. Um, and I have an example of that. So, um, I think I, oh, I think I talked about, I talked about this in my last um, SBAT, that was last Sunday. Um, I was trying to teach the coven about wards and I was telling the coven that there's a time and place in everybody's life where they felt protected. There's a time and a place where our grandmothers and our mothers, they sang to us and they prayed over us and they prayed for us. And those prayers are still active today. Those are still working in our favor. And we have to have a different relationship with it. We can still go back to those songs and those prayers and receive that same protection and that same love. And we can take that and give it to another goddess or leave it to a goddess, right? Um, I was singing this song to my granddaughter and um last week i was telling i was singing to her i am a child of god and my purpose wasn't to tell her that she is or that i am my purpose was to pass on that blessing from my grandmommy so it took a long time to get here i wouldn't have been able to do this 10 years ago right i wouldn't have been able to sing i'm a child of god so i sang it to her and she literally smacks me and she goes no stop i hate it <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, received. I got it. Yeah. <laughs> so, she was like, we're breaking that generational curse here. <laughs> Excuse me. So, but my grandmommy was there. You know, I um, felt her. Lila June Black from the LDS church, who f was certain she was going to marry God when she died, was there. She was there. And she yeah. and that blessing was passed from me because it was given to me onto my daughter. And mm -hmm. I happen to know because of my research on Hecate, she's one of my favorite goddesses. Me she too. is so easy and hard to work with, but she's very welcoming. And um, cults of Hecate, Hecatean cults go back for millennia. They are so ancient and they're so rooted in the occult. I lost my train of thought. I'm sorry. You're good. What was I yes. saying? I was going to say, you were telling the story about singing I Am a Child of God and how your grandmother was there. So, Oh, yes. Yes. I okay. Know. I knew in that moment that my grandmommy was there. I felt her. I felt I felt the presence of the church. I felt the presence of the gospel. Um, and But it wasn't mine. And I didn't need it to be mine. I just needed it to be there because I needed my granddaughter to experience her heritage, whether she accepted it or not. And she didn't. She very much was like, <laughs> I'm going to pass. Right? <laughs> and I, felt I also felt Hecate there. I felt the goddess. And I felt like it was a key that had been unlocked. And it's something that takes time. It didn't mm -hmm. start out that way. And I didn't, I never sang that to my children, right? I'm singing it to my grandchildren, right? Oh. Be, and she said no, so I won't do it again. <laughs> but, um, so it starts with the small things. It's okay to pray to a goddess. And it's okay if we are feeling those feelings that we felt previously. 
we can say, yes, I want to keep this or no, I don't. And I've personally started praying to Hecate again because, um, and this was after many, many years of not praying, but there's literal physical and psychological benefits to praying um, that we get by having that conversation with a deity. So um, I would say start with an offering. Start by do, by bringing some of your things that you did like from your previous culture, from your previous religion, and practice those things. Try it out. That's that's my recommendation. Cool. I love that. I I really appreciate that insight because I feel like the LDS, like a lot of my faith in the LDS religion was based on feelings I felt, but they very much so came from things that were connecting with my ancestors. When I found like kind of ancestor veneration and stuff like that, and started working with my ancestors, I was like, this is why the church felt so good to me, because yeah. I was having this connection. And it was like encouraging me to have this connection. And so I feel like I have a little bit taken that with me but i love that framing to kind of look at the dd aspect as well that's very helpful thank you another thing um i also offer libations to my lds family members if they can do baptisms for the dead bitch i'm gonna baptize you here i'm gonna offer like come come here come have this I seriously lead them offerings and i shit you not they're accepted every time every time wow. every time they're like yep yep yes <laughs> so so it's wow. like I, I just make it both ways right like i'm not trying to i am trying to deconstruct but it's not in a, a place of disrespect it's like i'm going to offer you the same thing but mine doesn't have a contingency and our family can be together or not regardless right like whatever i like that a lot actually like the, the reverse of it and that make that's pretty cool I was remembering when I was coming out of um, deconstructing from the evangelical church, like even the word God or Jesus or angels was kind of triggering to me just because it was just like the center of everything in our lives. And then I was seeing like even like the spiritual witchy people were using angel names. And I was like, well, those match with the names that were in the Bible. So it was just like very confusing. So I just didn't do angels at all for a really long time. And then I kind of started like getting back into it, but changing that um uh, from a male centered view to a female perspective yes. of female deities and female um, like ancestors and things like that. But then I moved to Utah and I had a, a ghost in my house that was Mormon and she wouldn't pass on because she was waiting for her husband to take her over. And that's when I, it was like my first experience with how fucked up this all is that even in an afterlife, people can get stuck with these like rooted like thought patterns. I had to call oh. in a professional. <laughs> That's it took wild. seven days so, to cross her over. Oh yeah. So this is this is one of the things I want to talk about that I, I do in my work. So I read tarot, and I get a lot of people that talk about religion. And one of the things I experience is all of those different religions. I've had this wonderful experience where people from all over the world have come into my home. I have a parlor. I call it my tarot parlor. I'm in it right now. Um, <laughs> Here, I can show you for three seconds if you want to see it. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. <gasps> it's, where oh. I tarot. Oh, it's gorgeous. Um, I love it. Okay. Um, but so I've had a lot of people come here and it's so interesting because I can feel religion on them. Okay. So hear me out. I can feel like when they're deeply connecting to a Mormon God. I can feel when they're deeply connecting to like Odin. I can feel when they're connecting to gods that I don't even know the names of. So you said something that really piqued my interest because I, I this is how I feel it. So um, I can feel the other person's religion on them. So I truly feel like you said that we, it creates almost this portal and it's this, group or this collective that all of these people are praying to or experiencing and it's like there's all of these seeds and each seed i can feel it in the ether and each seed belongs to the religion and i can feel when people come to me and i can feel when they're like with the mormon god and i can feel where these exist in the ether but i can also feel that it's bigger than that so it's mm -hmm. really interesting because i really do think religion is almost compartmentalized like that and i really do think we add to that collective and we can take from it too very cool that was my story <laughs> I, I like love that it. yeah 
Well, I always wonder too, because like people talk about heaven or hell and I'm like, well, maybe like they put so much thought into it. Maybe it does exist for them in just a way that it doesn't, that they didn't foresee it. Or maybe yes. they're living in hell right now. Yeah. <laughs> sure. so well, I mean, there's also the truth behind um, collective thought. So mm -hmm. if you have millions of people that believe in the same God or the same creation source or whatever it is, it definitely amplifies that anchor point um, because they're all pulling while well, giving energy to that space. Yes. Yeah. They're, cre it's, they're creating it. You know, it is something that is being created. Yeah. That's so interesting. I've actually never thought about it in that, um, you know, context before. Yeah. I wouldn't have been able to, but I had so many people come to me and I could feel it differently and I could feel, and I'm like, okay, what am I seeing? Why am I seeing it differently? But like, there are times that I have people walk into my parlor and I'm like, I have to talk to them. Like, like Jesus Christ is standing right here. And sometimes he is, and I don't believe in Jesus Christ. I don't, I legitimately do not because I, I, I know I can feel things that are and are not real. I, I know what is and isn't real, but I can tell you that there is an aspect of Jesus Christ that is real. And he has visited me in my motherfucking parlor. You know? <laughs> I love that. Kat actually has told me before, like this really cool concept of what Jesus could have been. Yeah. I was told at one point that if Yahshua, Jesus, whatever, um, was an actual human person, it's highly likely that he was actually a Veda. He was a Vedic mm -hmm. healer mm -hmm. um, because there were many people that were Vedic healers that had the ability to do the things that are reported that Christ did, but not that he was actually, you know, virgin birth, son of God type of <laughs> archetype, you know, that's all just a made up archetype, um, which is stolen from other religions yes. and cultures anyway. Um but I do, I do agree that I think that there is some aspect of that. I lean towards more the I, the actual archetype of compassion towards other people, being helpful, giving to the poor, feeding people, like that type of archetype. Um, in that level of consciousness, to me, is what that represents. Because I also am like this guy sus i don't think especially white jesus <laughs> i'm not down with yeah that. white jesus, jesus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but i always thought that was super interesting and i'm super glad i had a teacher many many years ago that had brought that up that you know um anthropologically there is a little bit of evidence that shows that people like that did exist but of course a lot of that has been erased and destroyed um because um you know, a lot of those ancient cultures are suppressed, and the Vedic are one of them. So, mm -hmm. I love that. I love that philosophy. I share that very similar. I think that there have been many healers. There have been many different. Yeah, I don't know. I think there's been a lot of Jesus Christ's, right? I think that, sure. or whatever. I don't know. Whatever you want to. I think I connect more to the Jesus Christ because of my Mormon roots. So that's why he's like Jesus Christ to me. And he's white too, by the way, because, you know, <laughs> the Mormons believe he's white. They oh, really do. Of course. Not that up. I believed he was. And then one day I was like, oh my girl, you're not stupid. <laughs> yeah. The only white. Just like location wise, it didn't really it didn't make sense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. I remember when I was first deconstructing, I told my husband, I was like, I don't know how far back this goes. And then like kind of felt through everything. And I was like, you know what? Maybe Jesus existed and he was a really good dude, but like this is not his church. Cause the LDS church calls themselves the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints. And I'm like, this isn't it. <laughs> <laughs> even if he didn't exist this was not his church <laughs> this is white jesus's church sure he's an imaginary yeah. character <laughs> but i i also like the idea of tulpas right and that's kind of what that thought form creating 
something in the universe because we are putting so much energy in thought into it. So yeah, it makes me think of that as kind of this creation um, of an entity or a God or whatever. Julie or yeah. Megan, either one of you might know the answer to this. What are the Latter-day Saints? Is that like referencing to, like people in the Book of Mormon? Are they supposed to be like the Latter-day Saints? We are. <laughs> yeah. So we're the descendants of the pioneers. So we are the latter right now, the saints of this particular day. So like um, the church was created by Joseph Smith and Joseph Smith, everybody that came after him would be considered a latter day saint. Leave it to a man to phrase it like that. But don't we, <laughs> You're like, after yeah, me. That's so fascinating because <laughs> the way that I understood it, like, Mormon people or LDS people don't really subscribe to sainthood like the way that Catholics do because saints are like to me when I hear the word saint I think of Catholicism like mm. that's heavy in the Catholic religion so it kind of like always I was like hmm I wonder who the saints are of the Mormon church but then I always thought maybe it was like a super secret thing and I never have been through the temple. So I thought maybe that you had to go to the temple to learn who the saints were and I never was going to get there. Um, okay. So that's interesting. So anybody in the religion supposedly has, is a saint then? Well, let me, ex let me, it's, it's bigger than that. So let me give you a, <clears throat> I'm going to roll up my sleeves. Okay. Please. So, <laughs> um, this is how it works. So everybody that is a member of the LDS church, they become a Latter-day Saint. So they have the ability to baptize into the church. Once they baptize into the church, they become this Latter-day Saint. Saint is not the same as a ca in Catholicism. So you yeah. can't reference the word saint and expect the same meaning. Because mm -hmm. in the LDS church, when you become a Latter-day Saint, that means that you are uh, trying to achieve that um that purity you're trying to live that essence it isn't that you are an actual saint it's not even talked about in the sense that like if you are really in the church you don't really know what a saint is you wouldn't know that you mm -hmm. would just know that a latter-day saint is something you want to be it's something they hold over you you have to achieve it i see okay gotcha yeah. wow huh also, it's why you find so many doomsday cults that are kind of associated with the church because there's so much about the end of times that is kind of inscribed in that idea of latter day, right? Because they're saying like, these are it. <laughs> this is the final time until, I'm, not that the Mormons believe in the rapture, but like until that's happening, you know? But they do, don't they? I thought they did. Um... It's more so the resurrection, yeah. I feel like, is at least a word that oh, they use for it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I interpret it as the said, same thing. Yeah. My dad kind of said it was like that the Mormons more believe that the meek shall inherit the earth, which is why the Mormons have like so many toys and properties and all the stuff to stay underground for so long, whereas the Christians believe they're going to float off to heaven and they could give very little fucks about belongings or whatever well some christians i mean think there's some definite duality there but that, at least that's how my dad described it to me so i don't know if that's yeah that makes sense because i do think that there is a heavy bunker mentality that exists within the lds religion having food storage and having you know weapons that you could hunt with and things like that to ride out the last days it's one of their tenants, or I don't know if you call it a tenant. I don't know what they would they call it, but it's one of the things they they have yearly discussions. How is your food storage? Mm -hmm. um, are this is how you can goods. This is how much water each individual person needs to have. You should have a backpack of food. Like it's literally they 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 are preppers. <laughs> they are ready for the end. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that, so we, when we had the earthquake two years ago, wow. <laughs> <laughs> and COVID. I will tell you the that COVID is one then the angel fell. <laughs> that I definitely have. My mom was also a little bit like that for sure. She had a lot of food storage and a lot of um, kind of prepper stuff, but she lived in Montana. So it wasn't always just like end of the world things. 
But like if there was a big weather event and she was stuck at her house, you know, because she lived so far north. But um, I definitely have, I think that is one holdover that I have culturally living in the valley. Because I for sure have 72 hour kit. I have food storage. I have water. Um, and when we had that earthquake, I put all of it in the back of my car and pulled my car out of the garage because if it was a before shock and an earthquake happens, if your house moves, you can't open your garage. So yeah. you are supposed oh. to pull your cars out and um, like make sure that you're getting any supplies that you need out because if your foundation becomes unstable, like the fact that I know all of these things, <laughs> show, like, it's so embedded in wow. the culture here that it is it's pretty fascinating but along that yeah. same vein then um i do have a question about um the cult aspect of it and your deconstruction around kind of what that looked like and how that looks for you from an external perspective now looking in um i'm always curious to me because a small cult I understand. It's very difficult for me to wrap my head around the fact that there is a cult at the level of millions of people all over the world that hold membership in it. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just, I, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, that's right. I think that um, it's hard because you, when you, I was born into the motherfucking covenant. Okay. I, I was like born into it. <clears throat> and I, I feel that in my, I feel that in my family. I feel that in my every, in every aspect of who I am. So it's very interesting because I was raised believing I wasn't in a cult. I was literally, I knew that I was told my entire childhood that I was not in a cult. We don't do anything culty. Um, we we just want our families to be together forever. Okay, awesome. Well, um, the problem with that is everything the LDS Church does, they do to make it look like it's real. They they hold classes. They teach their missionaries demographics they have to teach to so that these demographics are more likely to be baptized. So it's in everything they do. And they keep you going to church constantly. They keep you, they have people that check up on you during the week. They tell you that you can't read any of this literature that states that the church is is bad or that the church isn't real so it's drilled into you and every practice everything they do is geared toward guilt keeping you there and then unattainable goals you're going to have your family forever so they know they know exactly how to manipulate people and they make it look good they make it look great you go into a church there's this big beautiful church all of them are the same and that right there makes you feel okay i'm at home and i'm at i'm at a place that i know so they keep everything looking good they keep everything um they have a lot of money and they ask you for money so they they ask you for this buy-in and and they have this back and forth so they're like this isn't a cult and then one day you're like i don't know 35 and you <laughs> watch you know, it's me i was 35 and i had never watched any type of television I mean, I, it just was not something that we ever did because it was so filthy. And I remember, what, I don't even know what I was watching, but I was watching, oh, it was Survivor. Um, I was really into Survivor. And um, I had watched some of the previous seasons when I was LDS, but I stopped because, again, it was a little filthy. Um, but I decided to watch it again. And when I was watching it, I went back to the same episodes and I saw on Survivor, there was um, in the in the beginning episodes, there's this um, timeline of events because I think they were in, I don't remember where they were, maybe Nicaragua, they were in a really ancient place. And they have the timeline events on this placard. And I read it today, or, you know, in this time period. And I was like, oh my gosh, there was information on that placard when I was watching it that told me the church was invalid that invalidated the entire existence of the church it was about like their i don't i can't even remember i don't remember the fact i wish i would have but seeing it again at like 35 and i was like holy shit 
that was a cold. Wow. It really took me that long. It took me that many years. And I've really, in the last probably five years, I've really understood that it's a cold. I, I, I can see it. I can see the programming. I can see that um, the modest dress was a way to um, stifle women. It was a way to keep us in the church to keep us in their practices. And so I just had to, I like, I recognize even today, everything I do, everything is rooted in religion and in that cult. And I really was doing culty things. I was reading Bibles. I, I was um, taking sacrament. I was eating bread and drinking water. That's, that's rituals. That's culty, you know, that's cult behavior. Um, so I just had to like, get out of it really 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 out of it to look back and i can just see in everything that i did and everything that i do now i even sometimes worry about like what i say or i'm like oh i shouldn't swear because i might offend somebody and it's just it's wild it doesn't leave <laughs> it doesn't I, I think that's the biggest thing people need to know it doesn't leave you have to deconstruct every day it's every thought it's all the time mm -hmm. yeah my dad kind of had a sermon where he would talk about uh, having a like boiling lobster, but you have to put the lobster in like room temperature water and then slowly turn up the water. And then the next thing you know, like you're in a cold, right? Like it doesn't just mm -hmm. dump you in your, and you're like, oh, cool. Like kumbaya. No, it's like starts out slow. And then the next thing you're like, why are they knocking at the door for ties? Like what in yeah. the mafia shit is this? <laughs> and it's strategic, right? They're yeah. so strategic yeah. about it. They're, it's down to, um, I mean, it's if, if we knew how strategic and how intelligent they are, it would be, I mean, you can see that it's intentional. Okay. It's intentional in everything they do. Well, and this is kind of the mindset that I went through was because like when I realized the ancestor work thing, um, I really felt like, oh my goodness, there are so many like practices that they're using that they're putting themselves between you and that practice. So I felt good when I was like communicating and working with my ancestors, but I had to go through their God to do those things. And, um, and because of that, like I, they were using these like things that to me really still are rooted in my spiritual practice. But they were just telling me that in order to get those things, I had to follow their rules to be worthy of it. And they use a lot of shame. And so to me, they're using like real things. And honestly, I think a lot of the people there today do believe it. And but they've we've just been so conditioned and that it's from like the top down of like, if you don't do this, you don't get those things. And people don't leave it and explore the side of what we're doing to be like, oh, I can connect to God on my own. Oh, I can serve my ancestors without having to hold the temple recommend or whatever. Yeah, they take away your autonomy intentionally mm -hmm. yeah. because you have autonomy. You are capable of thinking for yourself. And that really is one of the worst things a cult member can do. If you start thinking for yourself, you start recognizing that you watch Survivor and it can deconstruct your religion in 3.7 seconds, you know? But I, I think the weird thing to me too, I didn't say this before, but I didn't even notice. I didn't notice when it first happened. I read the, I read it and I'm sure I read it as if it was like a fake sign, but I had since done research and it was factual information. And so it was just weird to see that, see it from, one perspective knowing I was completely right and then seeing it from another perspective and then actually knowing that I was completely right the second time right mm -hmm. uh, one of the things I really enjoyed about the zoom that you hosted was um, one that everyone had a space to talk and that there were so many different religions and everything coming in and sharing but uh, the one of the things that I literally have two things that I haven't really been able to like get out of my head was one, someone who had asked, how do you, how do you deal with needing prayer when there's not a man around? And that was like, oh. like has broken my heart. I think about it nonstop. 
Um, Because at least in the religion that I grew up in, it wasn't necessarily like that. So it's like something a little bit newer for me. But then the other part was um, how you were... Um, you were talking to one of the girls that I think she was Methodist and telling them how, yeah, how the Mormons don't know that uh, the actual history of Joseph Smith and the 14 year olds and the minors and all of those really seedy stories because they keep that part hidden and then you're not allowed to watch the news or do your own research and all of those things. And yeah, those, those just really stuck with me. Yeah. Um, I think the biggest takeaway for me when she talked about not being able to pray without a man, it's the the fact that it's really true. I've had those thoughts myself. How, if my kids get sick, how am I going to bless them? How do I bless my children? How do I help my children feel comfort when I have to get the comfort from somebody else? Um, I think one of the things we can do to kind of combat that is recognize that we don't need anything outside of ourselves. We aren't, we don't have to have a goddess. We don't have to have a God. We, we, it doesn't even have to be a prayer. It doesn't, it can just be our own acceptance, right? Just those words, like, I, I, I need this help. I need this strength, you know, um, ask your higher self, that type of thing. Um, and then the Joseph Smith stuff, I don't even know. That is wild. It's just, it, it, it's sad because we have a testimony. Well, we, see, here I am being my, I'm going to just pop into my Mormon body for a second, okay? <laughs> no, it's true though, right? Because like, like I said, I, I deconstruct. I mean, you would never look at me and think that I had been LDS ever. You would never, you would be like, that bitch is probably like, I don't know, a witch. <laughs> you know, that's what everyone <laughs> literally said. Uh, but I I wasn't always like this. But um, so I do have to deconstruct even still. But I also want to say before I go into the Joseph Smith stuff, that it's okay for me to to refer to myself as Mormon, because there is a part of me that will always be Mormon. I did get baptized at eight. I experienced it. And it was very riveting, especially for me now, looking back at that. It, I built a lot of character. And the LDS Church gave me a lot of really good things. So I'm not grateful. I'm not thankful. Fuck that. But I am and I was Mormon at one point, right? <laughs> so... Um, but Joseph Smith, I remember being a young girl and they would pray to him. And I always thought that was so weird. There was not a huge emphasis on Joseph Smith in my home. It was more on Jesus Christ, Heavenly Father, and the Holy Ghost. The Trinity was very important. Um, and I, my first tattoo was like an homage to the Trinity. I didn't know that it was actually Hecate, but whatever, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> But I just remember hearing people talk about Joseph Smith, and I never felt good about him. He never sat right with me. But this is a man who was really good at lying to people. He was really good at making people believe stories. At the age of 14, Joseph Smith traveled to now you have to understand he was they were poor they didn't have a lot of money they worked in fields they had what they had and not a lot more um his family traveled he talked his parents into traveling to a seer in another town so this 14 year old boy actually at the time i think he was 13 he travels to another town because he hears of this girl that has a stone inside of a hat she reaches into the stone and she starts to um have visions she can see the future so he he gets really excited about this because he sees an ad in the put in the paper that he can go and see the seer and he's so excited and he had to save all this money if i remember correctly i might be wrong but whatever if i'm embellishing his stories <laughs> he, not the first, not the first time <laughs> <laughs> um, but so he had to save up his money and he goes and he sees her and he puts his hand in the hat. She lets him put his hand in the hat. He puts his hand, he grabs onto this rock and he sees this stone under a tree 
and he goes to this place and the stone was there. I'm not going to deny it. That shit happens. I can do shit like that, right? Anybody can. We can do that stuff. We are capable of doing that. Um, but it was really amazing. And so he had these stones and these stones, they were, it was very, um, very occult to begin with. I don't know if a lot of people know that, but the church definitely was very occult. Their religious ceremonies for weddings in the beginning were occult practices. They adopted it from, um, I don't know the specifics, but, um, their practices were very, woo practices and joseph smith was at the helm um but he he married a lot of women um he introduced polygamy into the church because he i truly believe he liked younger girls i mean he talks about it he talks about he he talks about some of the ways he got wives some of the things he did to acquire wives he would send I, it was either joseph smith or brigham young but they would send fam husbands away on missions and then the families would be under the care of the prophet and then the prophet would marry the daughters I, was it joseph smith or was it brigham young I, it was one of those two i'm pretty sure it was joseph smith yeah, the, I think that was in the beginning of the religion. You are correct. Yes. But also, so, he married somebody's wife, too. Yes. Like, yeah. Anyway, sent him away on a mission and was like, you're mine. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, but they did. So, again, this isn't stuff we talk about, right? Like, this is never discussed. I think the first time I heard anything really weird about Joseph Smith was when I had decided to go through the temple. And my um, bishop at the time, he was like telling me about a story where um joseph's wife's joseph's wife emma did not agree with the church she didn't agree with the way he was doing things um he would bring people while he was transcribing the plates and he was building his religion he did it inside of a small cabin and they would be upstairs in the cabin they'd be drinking it was either a cabin or a church it was a cabin yeah and they would be drinking and they would be spitting their tobacco on the floor. And then Emma would have to go and clean it up. And Emma's like, bitch, I don't want to do this shit anymore. I'm not doing this. <laughs> like, if you're going to do this, I'm not doing it. So that's kind of how the the um, their little word of wisdom came around. Because Emma was like, fuck this. I'm not, I don't want to be part of this. Um, and Joseph was marrying women behind Emma's back. And he... Wow he they actually were living separate lives and so my my bishop is telling me about this and my mouth is hitting the floor and i'm just like what 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 are you even saying i can't believe to your me? bishop told you yeah i know they it was wild. That usually. <laughs> no it, i i had no i was like wait they, they did what they went what and i just sat there and i was like okay but um that was my real introduction to joseph smith and mm -hmm. I mean, there's so many more stories, but yeah, he's, he was very, very dishonest. Very. Yeah. Yeah. My mom was really, really against the word of wisdom. Um, she just thought it was bananas, garbage, so hypocritical, the most hypocritical text that's ever been <laughs> written for a church. Um, because she just it was like, I couldn't understand ever how she couldn't get a temple recommend because she had coffee and a tequila or a glass of wine sometimes. But then her neighbor could be on Valium and drink Diet Coke all day. Mm -hmm. like, which, if it's supposed to be a health directive to make sure that your body is clean and your body's a temple, which one's healthier? You know, like if you're being pragmatic about it you know she just saw it. it was so bananas and then she found out the same thing that actually it was written because emma was like fuck you bitch i'm not so he was like oh well now god says we can't do these things mm -hmm. <laughs> Next. how yeah. convenient yeah when i was in high school um i was deciding whether or not I wanted to be in the church and at that time I was doing it behind my parents back so I was um on my lunch breaks I would go to the gas station and I would get myself a cappuccino <laughs> but it was like 90 so percent hot chocolate and like 10 yeah. percent coffee <laughs> right and I was oh my god I was such a rebel but I would drink it and I shit you not I was like 
I I knew coffee in another lifetime. Like it, it was so important. To me. I was like, um, at one point, one of the one of the bishops was like, um, "Are you going to let a small thing like coffee coffee keep you from the temple?" And I remember in my mind thinking, "Am I going to let the church keep me from coffee?" Um, <laughs> and then, <laughs> I love it. And then one day, I, I have this like loaded up hot chocolate. I spilled it on my seat of my car. <sighs> And it was probably my third time. And that was enough of a sign that I didn't do it anymore because I knew that it was God telling me that I was sinning. And my dad got in the car the next day and he's like, it smells like coffee. And I was like, it's hot chocolate, I promise. <laughs> so, um, I just remember at that time I was like, coffee is so amazing. And then there are, are literal health benefits to coffee, but there are literally zero to Diet Coke. Yeah. Yeah. Dyco makes no sense. <laughs> yeah. No. But it's their it's their juice, you know, their mm -hmm. lifeline. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I love all of that so much. I have uh, another question for you to kind of not necessarily change topics, but as someone who's I'm I'm not necessarily new, but I don't have like a coven or anything. Mm -hmm. Because I find myself hesitant, having been duped into going to one cult, to kind of invest in something else that's a group practice like that. And I'm sure. just curious if you have any suggestions for how to find a coven that is going to be respectful of your autonomy, as well as, you know honoring all of that so if you just have any advice on how to avoid a coven that might actually be a cult as well <laughs> um so it's kind of, let me back up a little bit it's kind of important that we understand that um so i'm not a cult leader i'm not starting a cult but i am dealing in the occult and we mm -hmm. do have occult practices and so there are rules and regulations that go into um the work that we do right yeah absolutely. Um, there is definitely a crossover there i i accidentally um was doing one of my s with my coven and i said we are a cult and like their <laughs> mouth dropped i'm like no a cult O C C U L. <laughs> We are a cult, right? Um, so, so it's just kind of important to understand that um, in life, especially where we are at right now, we are dealing with cults all over the place. It isn't just a religion. It can be our leggings. It can be um, our families. We can have a family system that presents as a cult. Um, because it's an organized familial system. Um, we can have cults within our friendships. So it's imperative to understand what a cult actually is, right? And it's important to understand the distinction between a cult that you are attending or cult-like practices, right? Yeah. So um, with that being said, it's very imperative when you are picking out a coven that you find a coven that aligns with your values. Um, I have personally made three, four different covens, I think. And um, I've, I've had in-person covens. I've had covens with people that are young and old and, and of all craft, all sorts of craft. And um, I think that rigid covens are difficult. It's difficult for people that are getting into it, and it's difficult for people that are maintaining it. But there is space for people that want that rigid, like, give me what I'm doing and how I'm doing it, right? Yeah. So so find if you find a coven, Google. I would Google it. I would Google, like, covens in my area, and then I would talk to them. I would, I would try and um, have, like, a, uh, like, a text conversation with, with a, um, a high priestess or a high priest. Usually, if it's a coven, it's going to be a high priestess because it's more of the divine feminine. However, we have cults that do not subscribe to that, right? So reach out, have a conversation, send them a message. Um, if it's a if it's a good coven, they're going to have a list. I, I, I shouldn't say that. 
<laughs> good covens are good covens, and they're all different kinds of covens. But an established coven should have a list of their goals. Have They should have it written out what they expect of you and what you can expect of them. Um, and then really find out if that co-aligns with your values. And maybe you want something that isn't so rigid. And if you want something that isn't rigid, you should be a member of Coven of the Dark Mother. <laughs> Insert here advertisement <laughs> Just kidding. Um, let, me, let me tell you about my coven so um like i said I, i've made three other covens this is the coven of the dark mother it is ambiguous it is dark and it is intentional um my coven is pretty lax i do not um, i have wiccans i have i don't care what you do i don't care what your religion is um i don't care what you practice um i hold space for people that need space and I, it is in, in the Coven of the Dark Mother, we honor all deity. So somebody could come in and believe in Jesus Christ, and that would be respected, and that would be honored. Um, somebody could come into the Coven, and they could, um, they could, they could be Wiccan and and have Wiccan practices. Wiccan is very structured. It's a very structured coven. Um, they only do their magic together. Um, so in my coven, I call it a hybrid coven. So we meet around um, the quarters and cross quarters in person, but we're all over the world. So I have a lot of people in Utah, but I also have people outside of Utah as well. And they can't be here in person because that would be really expensive. <laughs> um, so we will do events where, for example, this Sunday, um, one of the members of the coven is hosting um, Beltane and we're going to have tacos and fruit and then we're going to live stream while we're there. So the rest of the coven can also be a part of that. Um, and then uh, a couple other important things that I, I just, I, that, I felt were important when creating a coven. Um, when I selected the name, I actually, the previous name of my coven was Coven, uh, was the Black Branch Coven, which was my names, my my um, last names and my mom's last name. Um, but it transpired into this because I wanted to allow autonomy. And one of the first things I talk about in my coven is that the Dark Mother to me might be the Dark Father to you. It might be the Dark Mother to me might be Julie Black, but the Dark Mother to you might be Hecate or Gaia, or it might be Kali Ma, or maybe it's Odin or Thor. Like there's there's so many embodiments. It could literally, like I would not have a problem if somebody came into the coven, they're like, okay, well, I believe in um, Loki or Thor or whatever, right? Like that, I wanted that to be, I wanted to strip that away. The And the very first rule of the coven is honor your no. I don't give a fuck what that is. I don't care what your no is. I just care that it is a no, and I care that you express it so I can honor it. Mm -hmm. So that's like, that was, that's what I formed my, my most recent coven around. Um, so I recommend Google searching, find out, do you want something that's more hybrid? Are you looking for, um, somebody that you can do actual magic with. Um, there's also different places in Utah that have been popping up that are more pagan. Um, I would say that my coven is more of a pagan, witchy pagan coven. Um, we teach, I teach a lot about um, Celtic um, and Druidic um, teachings, but I, I mean, I will learn anything and teach anything, right? Um, and, and I offer other people to do the same thing. So that's kind of how, my coven came around and how you can find others. I love that. I think you brought up a really good point too, is like when you're leaving one thing and before you go into the next thing is find out what your no's are and knowing what your boundaries are before you go into the next thing, because <laughs> doing that inner work and research is kind of important. Like, okay, I don't want to harm others. Let's start there. Like, you know, go, going through and figuring out because how can someone respect your boundaries if you don't know what they are? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and that's why I wanted to for I wanted to I wanted to take I wanted to put autonomy back into it. Mm -hmm. I want people to understand that um, if you are I, and I I'm very much like if this is harming you in any capacity is it is a no. If I can see the discomfort, it is a no. I am more than happy to have your voice for you until you have your voice. I will help you with that. That is one of my goals in life. That is my mission is to give people a voice until they have their own. 
And that's super important in the work that I do. I love that. I love that. Yeah. 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 I had a, I had a teacher that kind of, you know, really opened my eyes about the fact that there's no such thing as bad and good, you know, and how yeah. we have this, you know, like whole conversation around deconstructing what good is or deconstructing what bad is. Um, and the, the, their philosophy, which I kind of have adopted too, is really the, the most, you know, cause I think when a lot of people, you know, flipping from, I'm guessing that we're going to have a, the majority of the people that are going to listen to this podcast are probably people that are deconstructing LDS mm-hmm. because that's just prevalent here in Salt Lake more so than other religions. But I do think that there is this kind of like, you know, um, because you're so indoctrinated from such a young age around anything that has to do with ovens or witches or any of those things when they hear that instantly their body is going to be like oh that's bad and it's, it's such an important no, yeah, part of the deconstruction process to, to be able to know or to be able to understand where your value of what good and what bad actually is where where are you drawing what good is from is that from being in doctrine is that from an inherent knowing that you have like what what does that actually mean what does good mean um and i say all that to say that um because i don't want people to be i love that so much and i love covens and i also practice craft and i um you know have my own set of beliefs and practices and um I think that it's difficult oftentimes for people when they're deconstructing to kind of be open about that because there is that inherent, I, what I'm doing is wrong. What I'm doing is bad. Like I learned my whole life that this is terrible things. And if I'm open and honest about the, who I am and the things that I'm interested in, all the people in my life are even going to hate me more than they hate me for leaving the church in the first place, or they're going to think that I'm even a worse person when there is no reality concepts of bad and good are constructed by society there's not anything you know i mean obviously there are things that are harmful and i would steer clear of those things like assault and you know doing things to other people um but to go back to loop back to what the teacher kind of was like you know the only evil that i've ever come to know in this entire world really is people that use other people's spirit to manipulate them and that is religion on the whole using somebody's soul to manipulate their behavior to be in a certain mindset which i think is really difficult especially with the mormon religion um because it does stick with you for for your whole life like things that are so indoctrinated into you become such an operating system that's happening in the background that even when you leave it's still operating there and that level of spiritual manipulation lingers for such a long time um i guess my question is do you find have you found as you have deconstructed and um been in covens that it's i don't want to say easier but does it does it kind of um i would assume that it kind of fills that spiritual community space that you lose um yeah. when you leave a uh, religion absolutely i think that's one of the biggest especially with the coven we have now that's one of the biggest drawbacks to leaving the LDS church, especially in Utah, is that you lose community, you lose actual family members and people, if you, if they find out you're in a coven, it's like, okay, that's the end of the world because now you're just crazy and wild and you're, you're doing witchcraft, you know, and it's evil. It's the epitome of evil, kind of like what you said before. Um, I think that 
the community portion is important and it's the one that I hear over and over. People want community. Um, sometimes they want to talk. They want to have a place to discuss things. They want to talk about what they experienced in their religion previously, or they just want people that aren't going to look at them like they're crazy or make them feel a certain way because they want to practice witchcraft, you know? And just <laughs> accept them for who they are. Yeah. Yeah. Mind blowing concept. Uh, I think that's one of the things um, with the coven that I really like to focus on as well is um, the resources that we do offer. We can offer a community. We can be there for each other. Um, we also, I, it's so important that in this space, people are able to feel what they feel, even if it's only momentary feelings it's valid they need a place to talk about that um uh one statistical fact um so a lot of the people in my coven are neurodivergent which means that they are on some type of the spectrum whether it be adhd or um autism or whatever i i have autism so i um created my coven this way so that people that are neurodivergent have a place that they can be neurodivergent safely um, I think that's important. And so my um, my goal in creating the coven was creating that space for people so they can be openly neurodivergent, like really speak their truth. Um, I, I really strive to keep people in there that are capable of doing that. And I, I strive to create that environment because it's something that people lack and it's something people need. They need that support. They need to <clears throat> people need to feel like they can be stupid without being judged. Right. Like we need that. And maybe stupid's the wrong word. We just need to be accepted for who we are. We need to be humans. We need to be able to be quirky humans that sometimes, I asked a girl to close SBAT, um, which is our Sunday meetings, three weeks ago. And she was like, I don't know what to say other than Heavenly Father. I'm like, girl, say it with your chest. Say it. <laughs> And she did, and she like shook it off, and she's like, okay, that doesn't feel right. And then she's like, I'm going to do it again. I'm like, no, you just said it doesn't feel right. If it doesn't feel right, we don't live there anymore. You tried it. It doesn't exist. That isn't your move. Try something else. And she's like, well, th then I'm going to use my name. I'm like, then say it with your chest. Um, so, yes, I think that it's especially the deconstructing religion courses is a place for people to open up to say those things, and I'm going to go back to the statistic I never said. Um, a neurodivergent person statistically needs to tell their story to three different people or on three different mm -hmm. occasions. They need to verbally say it to feel like they're being heard. Um, so that was another reason I created Deconstructing Religion, because I think that people coming out of that need it. They need to be able to talk about it. Those words have to come out of their mouth over and over. I really love that you have an That's open coven, first of all. But um, so if if someone's interested in learning about your coven or potentially joining your coven, how would how would people um, like what's the best place to find you, I guess? Um, so I do most of what I do on Facebook right now. I have an actual group and then I um it's called Coven of the Dark Mother, and anybody can go into the group. So if you searched on Facebook, you searched Coven of the Dark Mother, you would find the coven, and then um, we would ensure that all the questions were answered. And if they were, we'll let you into the group. And then when you get into the group, that's where I post about SBATs. I post about um, um, Sabbaths, um, classes, anything that we're going to be doing, I post in there. But I really don't, I'm not going to do the work for people anymore. I'm done being a secretary. So I, I let everybody into the group. We get it. The group. Um, then I, I welcome them to come to SBAT. And then in order to attend an SBAT, um, they have to understand that they are becoming an initiate. An initiate has to work with the coven for a year and a day before they can actually be a full-on member of the coven. Now, being a member of the coven means that they come to SBATs. It means that they do different rituals that, that allow them to go to a different level or to go deeper in the coven. Um, but they still practice other ways. So, um, sorry, I'm going, I'm diverting. Let me go back. <laughs> so, um, you come into the group, and then I, I have, they have to listen to the first SBAT. So, the first SBAT I recorded 
and it's an introduction to the coven. Um, I go over our, um, we have a coven etiquette document and then a year and a day document that I've created. And they have to sign both of those documents and they have to listen to the first SBAT and then they can start be, they can start attending SBATs. And that means that they're an initiate at that point. That means that they agree they want to attend SBATs and try and become um, an actual coven member. Um, now, if they decide not to go any further, then they don't have to go any further. They can still attend SBAT. I do charge a fee. I charge a three to five dollar fee. Um, actually, no, it's five dollars. I charge a five dollar fee for SBAT, but it's not required. They can come. They can learn stuff. They get handouts. They get to practice magic virtually, and then they're done. They get little notes. Actually, I have. I'm going to turn on my camera. Um, so I have. I, I create. This is a book of shadows. Oh, that can fill out every time they attend an oh, SBAT. That. That's so gorgeous. Um, so, thank you. Um, so it's just basically at their level. Um, it's at their whatever level they want, and they can they can get into the coven and become an initiate, or they can just come into the group and experience the group, and then come to SBAT when they want to. It's really I really made it open. So I hope that answered yeah. your question. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. I know I've heard before and something that I have kind of done to help have that community um, without like the kind of the step of committing to a coven because I know that can be hard because I mean it sounds like yours is very welcoming but I know that some covens are very like controlled in what you have to be able to bring and give in order to receive which is great like mm -hmm. totally get it but um I started a study group and yeah. like just created a discord and we all chat and like we would get together virtually. And so I feel like that's kind of a good step if someone is kind of in between the like not quite ready to commit, still exploring. Um, but do you have any suggestions if anyone's kind of in that space kind of things that they could do to connect more with the community or to kind of move into being ready to join into a coven? Yes, absolutely. Um, so I have designed it where we do uh, uh, coffee once a month where you can come and, and everybody always pulls tarot and it's just like fun witchy conversation, you know, and it looks, we look like a coven, which I love. I love looking like a coven in the middle of Utah County. <laughs> um, so those events are welcome to the public um, and those are hosted on um, once a month. And then the deconstructing religion classes, I think, I don't know what to call it. It's, it's like a group. It's really just like a group, right? Those are open. I think that's a really good place to start because we talk about ways in those deconstructing religion classes, we talk about ways you can get rid of your garments or your religious materials and either repurpose them or get rid of them in a um, more spiritual way or in a ritual way. Um, so I feel like those deconstructing religion, it doesn't cost anything. I just host it for free i i like i create my own cur curriculum i don't i don't even know half the time what i'm doing i'm just like this sounds good so i'm gonna do it <laughs> so um but i think those are some ways um also getting into the group there's no commitment there um it's an it is not private so people will see that you're in the group but um I, I don't think the group is as 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 exciting as the SBATs, but um, I do also allow people to attend an SBAT without charging. I will sponsor people and invite them to come. Um, so I feel like those are ways you can um, get to know Coven of the Dark Mother. And the coolest thing about it is you can be located anywhere, right? You can be located and still attend meetings. So yeah awesome i love that awesome. those are great yeah i yeah. can't believe it's been an hour and a half i know <laughs> i had a feeling <laughs> i had a feeling <laughs> like this girl's gonna talk okay <laughs> <laughs> I, we definitely this is perfect have. we had a lot to cover yes yes it's all been so interesting and like very engaging so i just like now was like oh my goodness i can't believe <laughs> it's been that long Oh, I love it though. Love it. Yeah. 
Well, thank you so much for sharing and coming on here. And also your voice for podcast is spectacular. You have to do a podcast. Thank you. Thank you. I, that is one of my gifts is my voice. I don't know how I do it, but you know, I, I'm not trying, I'm, I'm humble. Actually, I'm not, I'm not humble. <laughs> Life is too short to be humble. humble. Thank you. Um, but we really are an inclusive group. We want people um, I want people to experience what it's like to be accepted. And I want people to learn how to be accepted in an open space, because that's not something people are even capable of doing when they're leaving religion. So um, I, I know there's people out there. And if they're called to it, I'm happy to meet people where they are. I really am because I think that's important too. So I just oh want to put that out there. If you want to reach out and discuss, I'm happy to discuss. I love talking about religion. I love, I'm very passionate about what I do. And so I, I love to discuss it. And I, I loved being on here. This has been amazing. It's literally a dream come true. <laughs> oh, well, so thank you so much. That was awesome. Yeah, yes. we love having you. Thank you, guys. thank you for everything that you shared. Yeah, hopefully we can do some more collaborative work together as well. Thanks for joining the All Podcast. To find out more, you can find us online at academyoflogicandlight.org or on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok at Academy of Logic and Light. If you live in the Salt Lake Valley, we'd love to see you at one of our upcoming events. And don't forget to support our growth by joining our Patreon. Until, Until next time, lead with logic and light. light.